Sign in, how is that? Played with them this morning. So you did good. And I you miss your kiddos tomorrow. I'm going to go play with them for the weekend and get away. Okay, there it is. Yeah, he did. Did you have someone sit with the others? Or? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a great house sitter. Because oh, I had, I had my daughter's dog and oh my gosh. And one older cat that was, I uh, was when my daughter was little. So I have this to make it happen. I have to take it partly. But see, that's why I looked at the time too when I looked at the time. Luckily, I'm just gender. <laughs> Yeah, maybe or even. Hey, evening, folks. Like, like. Evening. Hello. I'll talk softly in there for you. Be quiet. Thanks, folks. Um, like to uh, introduce our uh, uh, interpreter, Sandra. She has a few words to say uh, for those that might need some interpretation this evening. Sí, buenas tardes. Si alguien necesita interpretación al español, levante la mano y les puedo alcanzar un receptor de interpretación. Gracias. Thank you, sir. Um, we have the color guard presentation this evening by La Cueva High School Marine Corps JRTC under the instruction of First Sergeant Grego and Gunnery Sergeant Rodriguez. And if you would all please stand for the presentation and the Pledge of Allegiance led by uh, one of the cadets, Cassidy, uh, Cassidy Sweet. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Juro fidelidad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América. 
y a la república que representa una nación debajo de Dios, indivisible, con libertad y justicia para todos. Maybe sitting. I'd like to have a moment of silence in honor of all APS graduates who've lost their lives while serving our country, please. Thank you. Could I have a roll call, please? Peggy Miller Aragon? Here. Lorenzo Garcia? Here. Yolanda Montoya Cordoba? Here. Barbara Peterson? Here. Candelaria Patterson? Here. Elizabeth Armijo? Here. Dr. David Piercy? Here. Uh, going to adoption of the, uh, I need a motion for adoption of the August 1st, 2018. Ed Board of Education meeting agenda and the approval of the July 18th Board of Education meeting minutes and the July 23rd Special Board of Education meeting minutes. So Dr. Piercy, I had a, I just had a question on the, on the minutes for the July 18th Board of Education meeting. Okay. Um, on the, basically the third page, the second to last bullet where it's talking about a letter was received from the Secretary of Education I don't know if it was a letter or if it was because I, I never saw a letter. I don't know if anybody else did or if it was just kind of the verbal between the attorneys. It was a letter. Okay, because I haven't, I haven't seen the letter from the secretary. Could we make sure the board of education gets the letter, please? It was a letter, though. This is the third page. I just want to make sure we're in the correct place. One, two, three. Third page. And where, where was it again, Peggy? It's just where it's the second to the last bullet or the third bullet on the third page where it says, informed that a letter was received from the Secretary of Education and said the basis for the appeal was not in sync with charter school statutes and no action would be made until advised of action, actions from both boards. Still looking for the thing. Please yeah. make sure I know where it is, just so I, one, two. It's the third page. Pages are numbered at the bottom. Yeah. Is it, page is it uh, Yeah, it's page three of six. I see, it's, the, it's at the top of the page. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm with you. On the top. I'm, I was looking at the bottom. <laughs> and board member Mueller. Mueller Aragon asked me if I remembered, and I was trying to think because it seemed well, like I, I didn't get a letter either. It, it seemed like the essence. I think it was. I think it was a letter, but uh -huh. I'm not sure that we got one. It seemed like the essence of the conversation or discussion was that it was, at this point, the appeal was in the hands of the PED at this point. Well, I think that's not the issue. The issue is whether we got a letter or didn't get a letter. Uh huh. Uh, Superintendent, could you could you find out whether we got a letter or not? Absolutely. And based on that, uh, either adjust the statement is to be a conversation or a letter. If, if, right. If we got one, it wouldn't be bad for the board to have a copy of it. 
I didn't get a copy of that. I thought it was a letter. Right. That was my discussion. I mean, just because it's saying we need to know what actions we have to take, so I don't know if we've taken any other action. I don't think we have any action to take. So. I think it's in the appeal of the secretary. Okay. That I'm pretty sure about, but I'm not sure huh. exactly the nuance of the letter versus that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so, assuming it's either a letter or not, and it'll be changed appropriately if it needs to be changed. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. We're going to recognition of students, staff, and community. Uh, board member uh, Yolanda Cordova. Let me just ask you a quick question. Yes. I can see it in there. Okay, so welcome to tonight's uh, board meeting and thank you for coming. Our first recognition will be introduced by Dr. Madeline Cerna Marmel, Assistant uh, Superintendent for Equity, Instruction, and Support. Good evening, members of the board and uh, Superintendent Reedy. Tonight we have the honor of recognizing an exceptional nurse. Ms. Cynthia Sunny Miller of San Antonito Elementary School has been named Albuquerque uh, Public Schools Nurse of the Year. Could we please recognize first our honor guard who are waiting here? Oh, yeah. I, I, for some reason, we did not have that on the list. Okay. And so we'd like to recognize them first so that they can. Oh, great. And so just a second, okay. So go ahead, you know how to do it. <laughs> so the honor guard, just come forward and come introduce forward yourselves. And Uh, I'm Cadet Lance Corporal Ryan Chandler, and I'm a sophomore at La Cueva High School. Thank you. Cadet First Lieutenant Cameron <laughs> Mayo. I'm a senior at La Cueva High School. I'm Cadet First Lieutenant Wharton. I'm a senior at La Cueva High School. Cadet Staff Sergeant Hunt, senior at La Cueva High School. Cadet Sergeant Sweet, and I'm a junior at La Cueva High School. I'm First Sergeant Griego, the Senior Marine Instructor at La Cueva High School. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're on track now. All right. Uh, Ms. Cynthia Sunny Miller of San Antonito Elementary School has been named Albuquerque Public Schools Nurse of the Year. Ms. Miller was one of 115 school nurses during the 2017-18 school year. Ms. Miller was nominated by her peers for her commitment to student health and wellness, high standards of personal and professional conduct, innovations, participation in nurse professional development, support of students and willingness to find resources for families, demonstration of leadership, coordination of care delivery, health education and strategies to promote health and a safe environment, collaboration with student, family, school staff and others in the conduct of school nursing practice, facilitation and interdisciplinary work with other members of the healthcare team. Ms. Miller, will you please come to the podium? And isn't it wonderful she's wearing yellow and she's, her name's Sunny, isn't that great? <laughs> Thank you for the ways you support our students, families, and staff. Let's show our appreciation for Ms. Miller.
Our next recognition will be introduced by Shannon Barnhill, Executive Director of the Albuquerque Public Schools Education Foundation. Thank you, Board President Piercy, Superintendent Reedy, and board members. This past spring at the Gold Bar Gala, we had the pleasure to honor a grantee who has received a grant from the foundation and was awarded the honor of Best in Class of 2018. Best in Class is an honor reserved for educators, administrators, project leads, who were awarded foundation grants and took that investment to pave the way for a successful future for their students. There were three nominees for the best in class. There was Cleveland Middle School for their Colts Clubs. There was Coronado Elementary School for their La Prensa bilingual newspaper. And E.G. E. Ross Elementary School for their Stealth Makerspace. The winner was chosen by the community. They had a chance to vote for the winner online. And so I would like to talk a little bit about our 2018 best in class winner, E.G. Ross Elementary School, who created a stealth, ma stealth maker space, which is a lab that, pro that provides hands-on learning, um, I'm sorry, hands-on learning environment. Again, again, it's so excited about this maker space that I can't <laughs> slow down. As well as a digital learning lab. Now the digital learning, learning lab focuses on digital liter literacy through coding language. And last year, um, Apple approached this class to this lab to develop, I don't know if any of you work on Macs, but when you have to reset it, you literally need to have eight arms and legs to try and push this button, this button, and reach the back and try and reset. So Apple approached them to make a device where it was one-handed and you could reset your Apple computer. And they came, out, came up with some really incredible um, pieces to give to Apple, and they did it with their 3D printer. So anyways, I just, a little tidbit, that was really exciting. <laughs> now, their Stealth Makerspace offers activities in science, technology, engineering, art, literacy, transformation, and health, so stealth. The creative space provides challenges that help students acquire and improve literacy skills while using the model of inquiry-based learning. And we have some photos of, of them up there. If you have ever had the opportunity to see this makerspace, or if you haven't, you're missing out. It is a mini Explora Museum. Mm -hmm. Over 450 students participate in this makerspace, and they join this makerspace once a week for 50 minutes. Numerous schools have come to visit this and experience this makerspace with hopes to duplicate it at their schools. If you have not visited, once again, you're missing out. This best in class program was the brainchild of Christy Snell of E.G. Ross Elementary School. Her love and passion for her students to explore, create, and learn through hands-on activities has truly empowered the students at E.G. Ross to reach beyond their potential. As the winner of best in class, E.G. Ross Elementary received 50, an additional $15,000 grant to further their efforts. You can see they received their check at the gala. We can't wait to see what they create, can create, and I just understand that they just finished almost spending that additional $15,000, so they are ready to start the school year with even more activities. Congratulations. Please join me in honoring E.G. Ross Elementary for their successful, innovative program, and tonight I would like you all to join me in recognizing Amanda Stavage, principal of, uh, of E.G. Ross Elementary, and Christy Snell, the technology CSN.
Our next recognition is also by Shannon Barnhill. <laughs> Thank you again, Board President Piercy, Superintendent Reedy, and board members. It is with great honor to present to you a loyal and devoted corporate donor whose service to this community is not a commitment. It's really and truly their culture. They're gonna get me, I'm getting all, I know because Jim Lujan's in the house. <laughs> They also have representation on our foundation board of directors. This donor is deeply invested in the community they serve, and some would say they are a household word here within the APS district. The TIG partnership has enabled the foundation to increase support to students through the foundation's grant programs, by funding amazing innovative projects, providing new experiences, and creating an outstanding learning environment. I believe a vast majority of us have personally had the opportunity to work with or benefit from the generosity of TIG. They hold a special role in the continued success of our students, our teachers, our schools, and our departments. I'm trying not to look at you, Jim. Are you crying now? Ah, oh, yes. <laughs> they treat us like family. In the spirit of their generosity, not only did they just sponsor our Gold Bar Gala and provide us money for our grant programs on a regular basis, they have something very major to announce tonight, and tonight is the official announcement here at this board meeting. So in the spirit of their generosity, they are going to open a new opportunity to increase funding to innovative programs throughout the district. TIG has developed a new yearly $10,000 grant that will be available to all the schools to apply starting this spring of the school year. The TIG grant, which is named Transformative ID Idea Grant, TIG, <laughs> has been designed to improve school climate, increase student engagement, improve and improve academic achievement with a focus on programs or pro projects where the impact would be for a large number of students with the opportunity for potential growth to multiple grade levels, school-wide, or mentored with additional schools. I'm almost done bragging about you guys. Thank you, TIG, for your strong belief in the APS education and having such an impact on thousands of students our wonderful teachers, and our amazing schools. We are so grateful that you are a part of our APS community. Will you please join me in recognizing Jazzy Shaparsky, Aaron Scott, and Jim Lujan. <laughs> Anxious to say something, can you tell? He's like, um, okay, I can say something. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us the opportunity to help make a difference. It really, it's a thank you. No, 
it's like a claw something or other. Thank you for what you guys No, he's not. It's for your baby. It's the real thing. Yeah, it's like a cloth frame. I think it's like something to hang. Maybe it's like a... There's no name on it. Maybe it's for you. Open it. <laughs> save the paper? Is that what you want to do? Yeah. You don't have to save the paper. Oh, I felt it, and that's what it was. There it was. With her name. Diana Cora. Carolina. Oh, nice. I said it is painful at the Yeah. I did. He was so much fun. Yeah. He's a Ryan. Go hug him. Go hug him. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those that <laughs> everybody for those that might wonder what this picture is of or what the name is uh, is happens to be daughter. his new daughter so I'm not sure where it came from or who did it but uh, it's great there stuff it okay let's do this we gotta get going okay. is it TIG TIG yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought he was totally kidding. All right. That concludes our recognition. Congratulations again to everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're now going to begin public forum. So whether you are here with a request for the Board of Education to consider, provide information, or just see how the Board of Education operates, we want you to know that you are welcome. The Board of Education has established rules for expected civil behavior during the meeting and public forum. Upon signing in to speak tonight, you received a signature form and copy of the procedural directive which outlined those rules for expected behavior. The presiding officer will enforce these rules as appropriate throughout the meeting. And tonight there are 19 speakers. Therefore, to accommodate the greatest number of speakers, each speaker has, I'm sorry, we have 17 speakers. I went to 19. It's 17 speakers, but we still, uh, in order to accommodate the greatest number of speakers, each speaker has one minute uh, for comments within the 30-minute public forum. The time remaining to speak will appear on the screen in front of you. You may not yield your unused time to another speaker. You are always welcome to submit additional comments to the board in writing if you are unable to convey your message or you are not able to speak within the 30-minute public forum. The Board of Education encourages you to stay for the entirety of the meeting so you may listen to board member comments before we adjourn. Only at this time may your, comments, may your concerns be addressed at the discretion of each board member. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up the first three speakers and have you line up and then we'll go from there. Uh, the first speaker is Mari Hosani. I think I said that right. Christopher Ramirez. And Tony Padilla. So we'll go with the first speaker. Go ahead. Board President, board members, and public. My name is Mahdi Husseini. I'm a junior Highland, at Highland High School. My parents are from Afghanistan and I grew up in Turkey. I have been in Albuquerque since 2015. English is my fourth language. I speak Dari, Persian, and Turkish, and I am also learning Spanish. I'm a youth organizer with Together for Brothers, and also I'm with Myers Youth Advisory Council. As a refugee student, I started at McKinley Middle School. I received a lot, a lot of help from my teachers and community. At McKinley, they realized other students were communicating with me using their cell phone at lunch to Google Translate between Turkish and English. The school called me into the office and offered me an iPad to use during school hours. Teachers were friendly and focused their time so I could know what was going in class. A neighbor was who was also from Afghanistan even gave me a ride to school with her son. 
I have also seen my refugee, especially African and other Muslim students, struggle in school. Teachers don't want to give them the attention or focus they need. Students who don't speak English. Your time is already gone. I'm sorry. Uh, it's all thank, you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Oh. Go ahead, Christopher. So, my name is Christopher uh, Board in public. My name is Christopher Ramirez. I'm the director of Together for Brothers. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate the opportunity, right? This is required. This is a part of the Open Meetings Act of the state of New Mexico. But an example of what just happened is I think an example of the authentic engagement that I want to see happen with APS is that our refugee students and families often aren't at the table and given the opportunity to communicate with APS at all the levels in their classrooms, in their schools, and definitely in these buildings, these towers. I hope that APS will support a newcomer school for high school students and also support authentic engagement with refugee and immigrant students and families so they can hear the voices of the people most impacted who are English language speakers. And the one last thing I just want to highlight, Mavi, as a leader in our community, four languages and oftentimes is seen as uh, having a deficit in his school rather than being the asset that he, has, he is for APS in our community. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the board. My name is Tony Padilla. I'm a uh, teacher. I'll be starting my fifth year with APS next week. Uh, my job is to provide the best education possible for any student that walks through my doors. And the only way that I can do that is to get to know my students. Because when it comes to their needs, they are the experts, not us. And I think that, that knowing my students and engaging them at, and, and, and listening and actively responding by adjusting my curriculum to meet their needs um, is what makes my classroom an effective um, and, and positive learning environment. And I think the same thing should be true for APS as a whole. APS needs to listen to our community members and respond by adjusting what we do to suit their needs. And um, I'm saying this with regard especially to uh, our refugee and immigrant students, that we need to listen to the, to the students and the community members and, and let them take the lead uh, to show us how to best serve them. Thank you. I need to, the next three speakers are Selene, it looks like Vences Ortiz, N Natalie Singh, and Florence Emily Castillo. Go ahead. Hello, President, Board, and Public. My name is Selene, and I'm the Education Justice Coordinator for the New Mexico Dream Team. Uh, I work with undocumented and mixed status students in middle, high school, and in college. I have witnessed firsthand what the lack of support, accountability, and equity in education does to these students. Not only are they facing institutional barriers, but also linguistic barriers that are not being addressed during their educational journeys. These students have been harassed by teachers and fellow classmates for not speaking English and for their immigration status. Additionally, they have been removed from adva advanced placement classes and placed into remedial classes when their teacher finds out that English is their second language. Thus, today we are demanding equity for immigrant and refugee and asylee students in APS through a transparent and accountable process that takes measurable outcomes in consideration for success, which are informed by students and led by community members and youth who are directly impacted and um, I do feel that it's important for APS to be held accountable for creating a program without the consent of the community. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Natalie Sang, and I am the Ending Gender-Based Violence Coordinator at the New Mexico Asian Family Center. I'm here tonight to advocate on behalf of the communities that we serve in order to stress the importance of creating a welcoming and nurturing environment for all students and to demand equity for recent immigrant, refugee, and asylee students in the district. As the child of survivors of the Cambodian genocide who came to the US with little working knowledge of the English language, I witnessed firsthand the difficulties that arise with traversing the educational system. Likewise, many of the families we serve at the Asian Family Center are low, uh, low English proficient. 
Not only do they have to struggle with navigating other institutions such as housing and employment, they are also tasked with maneuvering the education system right here in Albuquerque. It is hard not to see the association between the extra supports that ought to be provided to our recent immigrant, refugee, and asylee students and their families, such as transportation and focus on educational content through a lens of English language learning, and the possibilities for success in their educational careers. Thank you. Hello board, my name is Emily Castillo and I'm a PhD student in sociology at the University of New Mexico. I'm also part of the Ethnic Studies Research pa Practice Partnership with APS um, as part of the UNM um, side of that. And uh, first and foremost, I wanted to address the travesty of um, the one minute rule when it comes to cutting off the youth that are here. We never have students actually um, invited to the table or allowed to express their what they feel is best for their education and they're the ones that are on the brunt end of the decisions that we make. So to have a, we have an amazing opportunity with Mr. Husseini here to um, share those experiences and we didn't let him have those. Um, but I do wanna address the idea of the newcomer school not being geared towards high school students, especially in terms of uh, STEM. One of the things that has been found in terms of uh, successful STEM is that when teachers identify and incorporate students' cultural and linguistic experiences as intellectual resources for science scientific learning, they provide opportunities for students to learn and to use language and to think um, in ways that make them very successful. And I bring this up in terms of um, the, uh, New Mexico being a place for STEM um, opportunities and we're not preparing our students and this is a, an area where we could be doing that through the newcomers uh, engaging high school students. Thank you. The next three speakers are Tony Watkins, Janet Sayers, and Martha Favela. Hi everybody. Um, <clears throat> I first met Mama Ghazi over 10 years ago when she and her husband Lungale approached me about helping to organize an education forum with political refugees for APS. I asked what they wanted to get out of it. We just want them to know that we are here, Lungale said. So we invited every principal in the, in the international district, their board member, and other high-level APS administrators. We had a good turnout of community members and other elected officials, but no one from APS came. That was 10 years ago. Yesterday, yesterday, I saw Mama Ghazi outside of city center on a hunger strike. Clearly, political refugees are still not being seen or heard in APS. This is in direct violation of APS Family Engagement Policy KB, written by Family Center for Education and passed unanimously by the board in 2012. I encourage you to watch the press conference from July 30th if you haven't seen it yet. The problem is named the demands are clear, and there's a plan written by community members that would better serve political refugee, asylee, and immigrant students. Thank you. Um, good evening, Mr. President, Madam Superintendent, and members of the board. And I'll ad lib a little bit because uh, Martin is sitting by me, and I met Martin in 2008 when I was a volunteer with Catholic Charities and had my first experience working with uh, refugees that had come from camps in, in uh, Africa and, and uh, doing things with high school students that had no command of, of English at all. But have, So Martin's going to speak in, in my last 25 seconds. Yes, the Del Norte High School alumni, we're going to be helping at registration starting Friday and then uh, next Monday and Tuesday. I'm glad to say that um, the Chick-fil-A across the street from Del Norte is going to provide sandwiches and fruit for our Welcome Back Teacher Lunch, which is on Friday, um, August the 10th. And, <clears throat> and last but not least, thanking Margaret Callahan in real estate and Carolee Brown in uh, capital planning, and I. I think John is their supervisor. John Dufay is, they've been very helpful with our Hodgen project, getting information. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I want to invite uh, Mitzi Durant to be my translate. Okay. 
Can we do that or should we use our interpreter? You may use our interpreter también. Tenemos un interpreter. What is it? She can speak Spanish. Okay. We have an interpreter. Okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And, and we give you a little bit more time when we're doing this language oh. thing, so I want to let you know that, okay? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, hola, buenas tardes, señor presidente y miembros de la mesa directiva de APS. Uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, uh, committee board members. Mi nombre es Marta Favela y soy madre, esposa, estudiante y miembro de la comunidad. My name is Marta Favela and I'm a mother, I'm a wife and a student, a member of the community, of the immigrant community. Yeah. Soy voluntaria y organizadora de Madres en Juntos Nuestro Aire, Nuestro Agua, y estoy aquí el día de hoy. So I'm a volunteer and an organizer for the Mothers in um, Juntos Nuestro, Together, our, our Air, Our Water, Our Together, and I am here to ask APS. Para pedir equidad con sus políticas educativas que impactan a mis hijas y otros estudiantes inmigrantes y refugiados. Um, I'm here to ask APS for equity. For equity and uh, your educational uh, policies that affect my daughters and other student, immigrant and refugee students. Nuestra comunidad inmigrante, refugiados y todas las familias merecen una educación de calidad. Quiero pedir acceso a diferentes tipos de lenguaje y cultura en el programa para nuestros estudiantes, nuestros niños y jóvenes porque merecen inclusividad. So um, our uh, immigrant and refugee community and all the families deserve an edu a quality education, and I want to uh, ask for access to different types of language, culture, in a program for new students, uh, for our children, for our youth, who deserve to be included. Este país es un lugar de diversidad y por lo tanto debemos demostrar que las culturas y el lenguaje hará más poderosa esta nación. Jóvenes preparados multilingües que puedan afrontar los diferentes retos en cualquier situación y que el lenguaje no sea una barrera para, para nadie. This country is a, a place of diversity and therefore we should be able to demonstrate the cultures and the language and how they can make this nation more powerful, uh, preparing uh, young multilingual students to be able to um, come against different kinds of challenges in every, any situation and for the language to not be a barrier for anybody. A nombre de todas esas madres que luchamos por el futuro de nuestros hijos y las futuras generaciones, quiero agradecer esta oportunidad del día de hoy y pedirles que consideren tomar en cuenta la opinión de personas de la comunidad inmigrante y refugiada para saber cómo debe de ser este nuevo programa. Muchas gracias. In name uh, of, of these mothers uh, who fight for a future for our kids and for future generations, I would like to thank you for the opportunity that you've given me today to ask you to uh, take into consideration the opinion of people uh, who are immigrants and refugees in this community so that we can know um, how we can form this new program. Thank you so much. <laughs> hey, the next uh, three speakers, uh, Mitzi Duran, Pierce, I can't say your last name, Rabayo maybe? <laughs> okay, and I can't read this one at all because it looks like it's just a signature. Um, uh, let's see, the address is UNM MSC, who wrote that one? Okay. Martin. Okay. Yeah, that looks like it's Martin. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair and members of the board. I am not just one name. I am the name of every person who has had to be ashamed. I am the name of every person who has been made to apologize for their existence. I am the name of every person to live strong. I'm a Juntos Yo Promotora and a Senior Health Leadership High School. I'm here today because I know what it is like to go through an educational system that is not suited to help me. You see, I am an undocumented, underfed, and apologetic immigrant student who strongly believes that all students deserve to have access to equitable education that includes being in my language and in a way that I can actually understand it, not just the mere minimum. It is not enough to make a program that only covers K through six knowing that middle schoolers and high schoolers are at the age where we begin to realize and see what is actually going on around us and tend to notice all the barriers and discrimination thrown at us. 
There needs to be inclusivity in this program. The needs of immigrant and refugee students must be taken into consideration. And most importantly, the newcomer programs must take into account newly arrived immigrant students who face many of the same barriers in education as refugee students. And I'm saying all of this because I truly believe that as students are just for more than a number in the system, you want to create a program to help in the education of us beings but are not willing to make it in our language, accessible to immigrant and nationally students or in a way that we can easily learn. We need APS to work with us, students and families who are the ones who should be sharing what this program should look like. It's time for us to work together and for our voices to be heard. Thank you. Good evening, the board, the public. Uh, it, takes, it doesn't take ESA classes to learn how to speak English. It takes the support and the encouraging. Today we are asking APS to please listen to the communities and listen to the agencies and everybody who's here to please develop a solution to develop a newcomer program that will, that will meet the refugees and immigrants need. Our refugees and immigrants, they deserve to go to college. They deserve to become doctors and to achieve their dreams. Studying a program that will only meet six, only sixth grade, it's not going to help them. It's setting them to a failure. It doesn't set them to a success. We come here for education. We want to go back home. or want people from home to know that we're educated. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Martin Daisenga. I'm a refugee from Burundi, grew up in Tanzania, came here in 2007. And uh, I am uh, a part of Refugee Wellbeing Project uh, program for UNM, and also I am Refugee Congress State Delegate. The, our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. I always appreciate APS for the good job you're doing for we refugees and immigrants for the change you are doing for us. And I also recommend that we are here, we are part of this community for all whatever change or whatever support you need from us as refugees and a part of the community, we will be there to support you. So for, for whatever new program you need to establish, we know now we are requesting a lot of support for our high school students because they really, really need it and we'll be there to support you to help you to advocate for ourselves for also for your for the new program thank you very much thank you. right the last four speakers I'm going to try to read some names here so bear with me um, <laughs> I can't read the first one I think it's two I bet Edmund Mwamba um, okay that's the first one Rachel White Claudija Bottom and Mabumba Perna, I totally probably did a terrible job with those. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Travis, did, is he on there? Travis is Travis. Maybe Travis? is that Travis Tra McKenzie? Travis McKenzie. Travis McKenzie, come to the front. Go ahead and have him come to the front line. I don't have a. You don't it, have. Did you sign? Could up? it be in that one that didn't? I don't know. It's okay. I will just go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, body members and public. My name is Twite Edmond Mwamba. I'm one of the representatives of uh, the refugee parents at school. We appreciate uh, all of the effort that uh, EPS they are doing for our children, even what the teacher they are doing for our children at school. I'm a refugee from the Republic of Congo. I spent nine years in Zimbabwe before to came here, and I arrived here on uh, 2015 June. We are calling for cultural access for our education system. This includes having safe, informed space that keeps families at the center and values a strong language access plan. We know that beliefs, perception, relationship, attitude, and writing and writing rules that step and influence every aspect of our school functions. Thank you. Mr. 
esteemed members of the board, President Piercy and Superintendent Reedy. My name is Rachel White and I'm the former refugee point of contact. I have spent the last six years working in and researching effective newcomer programs. I'm very disappointed in APS's proposed newcomer program and it does not resemble anything that I recommended during my time as the refugee point of contact. <clears throat> APS claims that the new, newcomer program is being implemented, um, being modeled after the newcomer school in Denver. I visited the newcomer programs within Denver Public Schools and the APS proposal looks nothing like them. By giving only refugee students the option to attend a school um, does not constitute an effective program. Transportation for students district-wide needs to be addressed. Effective newcomer professional development needs to be invested in for K through 12 teachers. We can't segregate sixth graders into an elementary school. All English learners, including Spanish speakers, need to have access to the programs, and high school, high school students struggle the most. <clears throat> um, priority needs to be given to high school followed by middle school and elementary school students. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Mabuba. I'm from Afghanistan. I'm a case manager and uh, community organizer at a New Mexico Asian Family Center. It means I'm very, very connected to, the, to my community, especially the refugee community. First of all, I want to say thank you for the newcomers program. I just want to say this is not enough. We need this for our uh, middle school students, for our, uh, especially the high school students. Just this year, I found out that five of my high school students, uh, they dropped out of uh, high school and they started working as fast food because they don't understand the, speak, uh, the language, they don't understand the mat materials. And uh, I want more support for uh, my refugee communities for transportation. And that's it, thank you. Good afternoon, board members and Dr. Reedy. My name is Khadija Bottom, and I'm the founder of an organization called Vision Sankofa that advocates for African Americans and African refugees and immigrants. I was a former state employee um, and saw firsthand how refugees were treated due to the language barrier, so I retired and went to advocate for the African refugees. I have visited homes where the third graders outread the 11th graders. So I tried to start a charter school, but I was told by one of you not to start a charter school, but to make APS be accountable for the education of these kids. So I asked you, is that not what this audience is here to do? To make, to hold APS accountable for the education of these kids. Thank you. Good evening, sorry I don't have too much time for formalities, but uh, hello, I'm Travis McKenzie, uh, second year teacher at Van Buren Middle School. Um, I'm here in support of all of, in solidarity of everything that's been said. I, I wish there was room for flexibility. I think one minute's so rushed that we really didn't do justice to the people that showed up this evening to get their points across and share their stories. But in my short minute, um, I'd like to highlight that, you know, I think in the future and now we want to work collaboratively to bring the best possible education to our students, our families. And I think that's a shared goal that we can all kind of be grounded in. But honestly, it feels like it hasn't been very collaborative and there's a lot of people that put in a lot of work to recommend things that APS could do to support our students and our families and they were just changed last minute and we're dealing with that and that's what this is about and Madhi is amazing if you want to learn something he's on my Facebook live on my Facebook page I'd encourage you to hear what he has to say because it really is important our stories do matter you know and just to shout out Mama Ghazi was outside the office yesterday in a 12 hour hunger strike I mean it's pretty serious Serious. I showed up and drummed and prayed and hopefully that we can work collaboratively, but uh, it's hard. It's hard when you're only given a minute and it's hard when we're not at the table when the final decisions are made. So thank you very much. Thank you for your input. That concludes our public comment, our public forum.
Thank you very much, people. Uh, stay around. Um, we'll go on to the superintendent's report. Uh, superintendent Reedy. Thank you, President Piercy, board members, community members, and staff. Yesterday, APS held a job fair at Rio Grande High School. Open positions included elementary, middle, and high school teachers, special education teachers, custodians, secretaries, bus drivers, maintenance and operations workers, uh, computer techs, counselors, coaches, educational assistants, and substitutes. 35 schools and around 175 to 200 people were in attendance. Uh, principals were available for on-the-spot interviews and made 26 requests to hire clerks, teachers, and educational assistants immediately following the event. Mm -hmm. Substitute services was busy the whole time and gained quite a few candidates. I'm hopeful that the majority of positions will be filled before the start of school, and quite frankly, I think we're well on our way uh, to meeting that. This weekend, August the 3rd through the 5th, is New Mexico's tax holiday. And if you find yourself in a store that sells school supplies, please consider picking up uh, a few to donate to the school supply barn operated by the APS Community Clothing Bank and its volunteers. They need items like pencils, pencil cases, pens, protractors, rulers, scissors, glue sticks, hand sanitizers, disinfecting wipes, scientific calculators, spiral notebooks, and much, much more. For a complete list, please look on the APS.edu website. School has already begun for 11 schools. Eight alternative schools began on July the 23rd. And additionally, on Monday, Monday was the first day of school for Hawthorne, Los Padillas, and Whittier. In addition to the early start of the school year for Hawthorne, Los Padillas, and Whittier, they will each have an extended day that includes a genius hour. The genius hour is designed to help students apply core knowledge to real world enrichment activities. Monday, August the 13th is the first day of school for the rest of the elementary, middle, and high schools. I'm excited about the start of the new year and look forward to all of the adventures ahead. And there will be adventures. I'd like to end my report by sharing a new video from the communications department. They made this all by themselves and they've done, Daniel and the team have done a wonderful job. It uh, was premiered at ACE last week and will be shown at the economic forum next week to business professionals and decision makers from the business, government, and education sectors of the Albuquerque community. The video will also be posted on APS.edu website. So let's watch it now. You've heard the saying, you don't know what you don't know. So here's the Albuquerque Public School District you may know. APS is the only educational institution in Albuquerque that students and families overwhelmingly choose year after year after year. One more time. APS is the only educational institution in Albuquerque that students and families overwhelmingly choose year after year after year. like to brag about our innovative teaching and learning. Exploring and growing, we can get you from here to here, from here to here. students, we make it happen. 
literature, safety, fine art, music, algebra, chemistry, sports, forensic, theater, JROTC, choir, best buddies, student council, debate, robotics, auto repair, parent university. But wait, there's so much more. I know, but it'll take way too long. I can't have Albuquerque Public Schools. And long for Albuquerque Public Schools. Thank you, Albuquerque Public Schools. We have something for everyone and a success plan for every student in our academic master plan. Heard about our new zone approach? We're able to optimize the uniqueness of our urban suburban rural district by tailoring the needs of our students to their neighborhood. Superintendent Raquel Reedy spends time in all four zones to see her top five priorities take form. The superintendent's five priorities include the whole child, college and career readiness, early learning, attendance, and community and parent engagement. So far, so good. Graduation rates are on the rise. More students are trying and liking our huge catalog of academic options. Important friends from all over America are taking notice and investing in our students. And locally, more of you are giving directly to our students in schools. In fact, the APS Education Foundation recently raised its first $1 million. We have amazing partners, too many to mention, who help keep our students clothed, fed, engaged, competitive, confident, connected, and hopeful. There aren't enough words to express our gratitude for being there when we really need you. We're resilient. We're strong. We're inspired by other Albuquerqueans. succeeded all this together. Wow. Yes, we can do this together. Si lo podemos hacer juntos. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Reedy. We'll go on to special issues. The first issue is the update on the implementation plan for the next generation science standards. It's a discussion item. Uh, presenters are Dr. Madeline Cernamormo, who is the Assistant Superintendent Equity Instruction and Support, and Amy Melazo, who is the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction. I guess there's a PowerPoint with this as well. It would be remiss if we didn't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> President Piercy, Superintendent Reedy, members of the board. Before I get started, I'd like to take the honor to present four members of my Teacher Advisory Council, who are kind of my dream team. Uh, Heather Slayton Summers from Desert Ridge Middle School. <laughs> Susie Dunham from Jefferson Middle School. Crystal Irby from Next Gen Academy. And Leisha Herrenberg from El Dorado High School. They're my heroes. So um, we wanted to remind the board that um, the standards were adopted through a rule in the fall of 2017. They've actually only been in effect for one month as of today. 
The state adopted national standards as written with an addition of six New Mexico specific standards, which are really just local illustrations of national standards. Currently, 19 states have adopted the Next Generation Science Standards with an additional 20 states adopting the standards that are based on the Next Generation Framework. This represents about 35% of the student population in the U.S. right now. So when I try to kind of summarize in simple terms what um, the Next Generation Science Standards were about, what the key shift was, for me it was from learning about to figuring it out. So um, it's really an emphasis on inquiry and constructivist learning around phenomena. It's more of a change in an approach to learning in pedagogy than a change in the content or how we look at the content. There are also three dimensions to the standards, scientific practices, cross-cutting concepts, and disciplinary core ideas, which all combine to form performance expectations, which describe what students should be able to do. So when I started this process, um, I realized that while I spent almost 20 years as a teacher, I did not spend 20 years as a teacher of science and didn't know enough to really um, make a good plan. So I sent out a call to all of the national board certified teachers in the district who had an endorsement in science. And 12 brave souls stepped forward to help me in this challenge. Um, we met for three days during the spring. We had two days planned, and they all said after the second day, we really need an additional day. And so I am deeply, deeply indebted to these individuals who um, really worked hard at this and really put themselves in um, the shoes of all teachers, new teachers, inexperienced teachers, teachers at all levels to try and make recommendations. So they addressed one key question. How do we introduce, introduce the next generation science standards to teachers and what supports do they need in terms of ongoing professional development, instructional materials and collaborative opportunities? Um, the discussions were rich and ranged from general philosophies of education to nuts and bolts logistics in the classroom, but there were some themes upon which there was broad agreement. Teachers need to have an easy way to buy consumables for their classrooms without spending their own money. Teachers need more training and experience with project-based learning and inquiry. Teachers shouldn't buy instructional materials until we have a thorough understanding of all the standards and how exactly and what we need. And we, um, we should figure out if some of the stuff we have will still work and redistribute it among schools and levels. Teachers need more time to talk to other teachers about science. And some teachers don't feel as confident in their science knowledge as others and need some support. And that there are lots of great resources out there in our community that we could leverage and take advantage of. In addition to that, there were some recommendations that this group made that were uh, level specific based on the needs of elementary schools and secondary teachers. Some of the recommendations for elementary teachers were very similar. Teachers need time to talk to teachers at their school, and they also need time to talk to teachers in middle schools and high schools so that they can vertically articulate things. They need time to work with the science kits before school starts so that they feel confident in using them. They need extra support when they're a new teacher because science is difficult to teach. They may need some refreshers on science content and questioning strategies that are really useful for inquiry learning. And they know that um, the kits that we have currently may not align well, but they'd like a voice when we do choose instructional materials in what we choose. There were also some uh, recommendations that were specific to the secondary teachers. They were concerned about the availability of high quality instructional materials and teacher resources. Um, when they do find good resources, they want an ability to share these very easily with other teachers so that they can uh, maximize that kind of collaboration and online collaboration. They want to make sure that administrators know that their teaching may look different so that when administrators go into a classroom and see an inquiry-based learning lesson, they don't misinterpret it as chaos. They know that's what learning looks like. 
They want high quality PD, and that's more important than ever. And it should include resources and strategies that they can bring right back to their classrooms. So um, we used all of this feedback and lots, lots more to uh, inform our implementation plan for next year. And I realize this is really difficult to read. I'm hoping your copy is a little more readable. Um, one of the things that I thought we should make you aware of is that the PED does have a timeline for implementation, um, which has begun exactly a month ago. And I wanna share that with you. Um, their plan is a little different than ours. Their plan was that this year, all classrooms are teaching aligned to the next generation science standards. They have webinars posted online at the PED website and they did continue to have making sense of science workshops over the summer. In terms of assessments, and this will be in common with us because it's assessments are determined by the state. Uh, the SBA is gonna re remain the same this year, um, but there's going to be additional field test items that are added so that they can test um, how they, what kind of items would be appropriate for the new standards. End of course exams are going to be a hybrid that includes only the items that are common to both the um, old standards and the new next gen standards. And next, gen, uh, or next year all assessments are going to be aligned to the next gen standards. So with that in mind, we um, have a recommended timeline, recognizing that as a very large district, um, I really felt like the uh, timeline for the PED was not attainable and would just encourage frustration on the part of teachers and students. It seemed like an unrealistic expectation for a district this size. So we have a recommended timeline that um, we're proposing, it, which is similar. Um, for this year, we're recommending that rather than all teachers teaching the standards wall to wall, um, without any PD, that they just experiment with inquiry-based inst instruction and collaborative learning this year, that next year teachers take an existing science unit and modify it or redesign it around the new standards and try that out in their classroom, and that the following year, the 2021 year, is when we would begin full implementation of the standards across all grade levels. With that said, any teacher who felt ready and wanting to um, implement early certainly could, but I really felt like we wouldn't be able to provide them sufficient enough support to implement fully for a couple of years. Um, across the state and the nation, there's a recognition that there's a serious lack of high quality comprehensive curricula and instructional materials that are next gen designed as opposed to next gen aligned. So our state has partnered with four other states to co-design a curriculum that will be offered as an open educational resource for districts. Um, two APS middle schools applied and are piloting that curriculum called Open Sci Ed at Kennedy and Van Buren. And they've already undergone four days of professional development with the state to um, around implementation of units in this new curriculum. And it was really kind of exciting. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do to um, support teachers immediately is print out some resources that would be handy to them for as resources. So this is even as we speak um, at the presses with Graphic Enterprise System. Um, it's a set of the standards that are grouped by topics, so clustered together in meaningful groups that somebody could design a lesson around rather than just lists. It has some kind of basic information, some explanatory information, uh, the curriculum maps for all grade levels, standards, um, and we've had to hold off on printing because those were just re-released yesterday, but those are being printed for teachers right now. And just as an overview, this, this year our plan is to first begin by training instructional coaches and principals so that they can have an awareness of this and begin to be knowledgeable, um, have knowledgeable conversations with their teachers as they want to talk about what implementing the standards is gonna look like in their schools. We are planning to develop some very short um, 
as my department some short PD modules that can be rolled out to schools in little bite-sized increments, so like a 20-minute, 30-minute module so that maybe at staff meetings or in department meetings, people could um, do little small segments of PD to familiarize themselves with it. We are planning for a full day of professional development in January for secondary science teachers to begin this. Uh, the elementary teachers are all implementing a new ELA curriculum, and so we really didn't want to throw two things at them in one year, but um, I think the secondary teachers are raring to go and then could help the elementary teachers in future years. We're going to revamp our department website and put up all the great resources we can find so that as people want to explore, that material is available to them. And we've begun um, an ongoing process of reviewing any instructional materials that are made available so that when the adoption time does come around for us, we will have a, knowledge, a good knowledge about what's available out there. And with that, um, myself and my teachers stand for questions from the board. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, board members, comments? Board member Valerigan? I just have a couple of quick questions. So I know you said that they'll be, the EOCs will be blended. So what, what does that look like? So my understanding is that they are, um, that the PED has elicited, has gotten a bunch of teachers to come together and compare the um, previous set of standards with the new science standards and look for standards that are in common and then look at the item banks from the EOCs to find test items that align to that. So um, all of the questions that they ha would have would be questions that they had developed previously but um, we're covering topics and standards that were common to both uh, the previous state standards and the next generation standards. Okay. Well, that's good. I was just worried that maybe some people, you know, some teachers that weren't teaching yes. that yet, yes. <laughs> that would be difficult yes. for the students then. We were worried about that too. Okay. And then the formative assessments have to be, I mean, they're going to be the same. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other comments, board members? Yes, Board Member Peterson. So first off, I just really want to thank you for approaching it like this and really thinking about how do we do, how do we implement well and meaningfully and really recognizing the kinds of conversation that needs to go on between teachers because the fact is teachers in general and, and thinking about elementary school for, for instance in particular, Teachers have not had an opportunity to talk professionally about science instruction for a very long time. In fact, there's been a whole lot of pressure to block them from having that conversation. So starting out with that approach of how do, how do we teach? And one of, one of the things that struck me is how can, how can we make sure that teachers, like if, if there's one school where there are several teachers that are well established and ready to step in and start teaching. But I think you pointed out that there may be some schools where that's not the case, where there's maybe only one or two teachers who are ready. What can we do as a district to make sure that they have an opportunity to collaborate with other teachers at other schools? To in, because that'll give them the tools to go back to their own school, home school, and help in that process. So I have, a, I have a couple of, of hopes for that. Um, one is that our new STEM magnet pathway that we have um, in the Valley Cluster has said that they would like to be early adopters of the standards and come on board early and that they would be willing to serve as a lab so that people could visit their school and see what that mm. has looked like. We've had some other schools and teachers, um, some members of my team who have volunteered to be early adopters of this and share their learnings with other teachers. Um, one of my other hopes is that if we begin with the secondary teachers first, who are people who are a little more secure sometimes in their content knowledge because they've selected that content as their area of focus, that those teachers, um, we can bring them together with the elementary teachers to mentor elementary teachers 
and that there can be some, some kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning that happens as we bring the elementary teachers on board. Does that answer? That, yeah, that, that helps. Um, I really appreciate putting the assessment part to the side and saying what's important is figuring out how to teach. And we'll take care of the assessment when it's appropriate. Um, I also really appreciate saying teachers need a chance to, to mess with this before we launch into a huge investment in material. Um, so I just, I really appreciate the, the course that you're setting out. And I think it sort of ties in with the, a lot of the public comment that we had of hands-on, project-based, Learning is the kind of learning that all students are going to do best and that hopefully we can really look at how we meet the needs of a pretty diverse group of students in that process also. Um, I think I think that's everything I have for now. It's just, I, I think for the, from the board point of view, it's really important that we kind of continue to hear from you so that as we're looking at budget, as we're looking at instructional materials, we're really hearing from the practitioners um, that, that we hear about things in a timely enough way that we can really respond to that too. So we'll be, we'll be relying on you a whole lot to, to stay in communication with us. So that's done well. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, Dr. Prissy. Uh, I, I was just, I just wanna say, Thank you also for including the teachers in the development of it because I think it was, you know, that was really important. But what I was noticing as I looked through the list, it's it's great because you also have teachers that are teaching in a variety of settings that I think is really indicative of some of the issues of just where some of our school districts are. And so I'd be really interested too in seeing how, you know, it's rolling out as opposed to some of like our different zones and so to some of our issues, which I think is really clearly associated with a lot of our public comment tonight too because I'm really interested in how the ELA side of it you know starts to to come on board and do students have an opportunity to explore and step into those opportunities as they feel ready to do that and to get into maybe a course or explore a course with a teacher that is is teaching to one of those um, you know next generation science uh, modules so um, yeah I appreciate that and like um, board member Peterson I I too would appreciate the, you know the feedbacks or come back because I'm I'm assuming there will be some challenges um, and it will be important for us as a board to understand what those challenges are so that we could know like what you know what are the things that we're gonna have to take into account as we're moving forward with full implementation so thank you thank you teachers too for stepping up and volunteering your time because that's essentially what it is and I appreciate uh, your time and effort into that Thank you. Other comments? Board member uh, Armijo? Um, I don't have anything additional in reference to questions. My only comment was, again, thanking our teachers as serving as advisors uh, to Amy as well. So thank you again for your, your time, your energy, and your expertise this summer and, and every day. So thank you for that. But no additional questions. Thanks. I, do, I don't board have any questions. Board member Pierce, you have any questions? I, I don't have any. I, I just want to thank you for your, for your time and look forward to hearing from you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any others? Board member? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be interesting to look at this. First of all, the way we've educated people in science has been very stovepipey. Mm -hmm. In reality, you, know, you take chemistry, you take biology, you take, you know. But, um, so the question of how you do cross-discipline uh, kinds of assessments, for example, is going to be interesting because uh, students may know a lot more about one subject than another subject, depending upon what they're taking. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean that that's not what you want to do in science. You do want to do that in science. Um, I call it cross-functional training, is what I call it. For those of you who heard me before on that subject. Uh, <coughs> but the cross-discipline ideas are very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, the ability for us to work between mathematics, uh, biology, chemistry, science, uh, civics, English. all the other kinds of things, right? All the different languages that we've heard comments about here. 
are very important to the whole diversity of the idea of how we learn and what we learn about. That, that really is very important. The question is, how do you build your education system to kind of do that? In other words, I think we're evolving that. I think we are. I think we're trying to do that. We are trying to evolve those kinds of things. Uh, we may, we're not there, uh, or we'd be first in the world probably, but, but that is the idea. And so I, I think this is, this is the right kind of thing. I think, again, it's going to take a little time. We, we can't be totally impatient about it. We, you know, in all of these areas, it takes a little bit of time to figure out how we want to work it, how we want to make the program work. And so I like very much, like we've said, to, to allow the teachers a chance to kind of try and experiment this because they'll figure out how to do that if we let them do that, right? And uh, working with the students, working with the community, because we got a lot of community people who, who understand a lot about science in this community. Mm -hmm. And so I think, again, with our ideas of community schools and those kinds of things, working with our community, we'll see a lot of, of energy around trying to say, oh, well, let's, let's try some of these things, you know, that you guys are going to be working on. So uh, I'm very, very uh, pleased with the idea of the framework in particular. I like the framework a lot. I'm, I'm not all excited about adding new things. I, I think there was a great set of people who worked this out. So, uh, but hopefully we in New Mexico will learn from all those people that are putting things in, not just try to make up our own thing uh, and, and try to learn from that. Uh, so as we get curriculum, as we get things understood, we'll try to incorporate that. So hopefully that'll be good. So. Thank you very much. Appreciate the presentation. We'll go on to uh, item B, which is the briefing uh, on the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, the Nile 35th Annual Conference. And our board member, Peggy Miller Argon, uh, was there and is uh, one of the members of the board. So, Peggy, tell us what you learned or what you didn't learn or a whole what you lot. wanted to learn and what you well, hoped to learn. A whole <laughs> lot. And just so everyone knows that this is just what I heard, so none of this is, has any of my opinion in there. So it's just the facts as they were presented. So um, I'll just tell you about a couple of the um, sessions that I went to, because it'd be impossible to go through, through all of them. I just, I couldn't do that. So one of them um, that I went to that I know is important here in, in New Mexico and across the country was, titled A Strong Financial Future, The Importance of Pension Fund Management. So some of the things, they, they had several people speaking, different advisors, and they had the mayor pro tem from Santa Ana, California speaking. And some of the things they said that were important were to go to a defined benefit, to go to a defined contribution, um, the promises that are made by the government, they're, they're promises that are made and we have this assumed rate of return, which is the chicken, or we have the pension, which is the promise, which is the egg. And that's exactly how they, how they said it, so exactly. Um, then they talked a lot about the buying power of, of Latinos. Uh, it is, the buying power is like $2.1 trillion, which is tremendous. And in their pension funds for Latinos, it's like 20.8 trillion in their pension fund market, which is huge. Um, one of the things they really talked about is if Latinos would control the money, then they were, would be more able to control the agenda. So a lot of why we don't have the political power is because we don't have the economic power. Um, and then the, San, the mayor pro tem of Santa Ana, her name is Michelle Martinez, she, she spoke and she was very dynamic. And so she talked about uh, when she first started on the council, um, she just was, oh, let's give, 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 give. And then you know what happened. Everybody knows what happened in Santa Ana. So they're trying to get back to where they could because we know what happened. So some of the things that she said is that the quality of life will diminish as raises are given without money coming in, obviously. She said that taxes are regressive and they really do hurt the working poor. She said that in Santa Ana they gave raises, but then they had to implement a tax. 
So she stressed being fiscally conservative and responsive. Um, and a lot of times she said what's hard is doing the right thing. But of the 699 vacant parcels, half of them are owned by Santa Ana. So that's obviously concerning, concerning to her. Um, she said if we don't do the right thing, our communities will suffer. Um, she also you know, said just like us, we know that most of our budget goes to salaries. So her thing to tell them in Santa Ana was stop giving raises. That was her thing, is um, figuring out where we can cut. She said, what we do is when we give raises, they are in perpetuity in the form of pensions. So that's what she said. Um, one of the things that um, she said, if a federal judge was brave enough to put this out there, that they, she would think that dumping defined benefits was the thing to do. Um, and she also said, if you don't have a pension stability fund, I don't know exactly know what that is, she said to create one. So I know Tammy's not here, but we need to see if she could talk to the pension people, so our ERB, et cetera, para. Um, she said, one-time funds can't balance a budget. Um, and we all, we all obviously know that we can't give raises from one-time funds. So she said in the pension funds that we need to make sure we have venture capital, private equity, public equity, and to make sure you have a certain portion of real estate in your pension fund. She said the most Im important thing is that we have a fiduciary responsibility and the return on investment is the main responsibility. If you do well, we all do well. So to be, and to be socially, Fiscally conservative, but socially responsible. Yeah. Um, then I listened to some people talk about um, some colleges and things that they could do, and one of the most important things that this person had to say was to get transportation out of the way first, because that really affects, that we don't realize how much that really affects a child's ability to learn if they can't get there. Got to get that out of the way first. Um, and then incentives need to be aligned around completion, and this was more talking about higher education. Um, they talked about having the community, everybody having one goal, having everyone involved, the business people being at the ground level, which I know is something that we do try to do, to use innovation funding to lower the cost, use technology, demand better, having everyone held accountable, and that education doesn't, doesn't just belong to school board members, that it belongs to, to all leaders, which includes business, state leaders, national leverage, just not us. Then I went to one about the opioid crisis, which was, um, it was very interesting. There is this company called Biobot Analytics Company, and what they do, and this was fascinating, is they test wastewater. And as I said, we all urinate. <laughs> Sorry. So you can estimate the opiate, opiate metabolites, I guess, right? So they just measure for drugs in their water so that they know what drugs are being used and they can send out the right resources. So if you know what's being used, then you can send out who you need out into the community. So I thought that was rather fascinating to me. So, um, and they're growing too. It's a small, I mean, it's a company that's just starting out, but they do have some, some small towns in, that are using this. Um, and the Addiction Policy Forum said that we have 21 million people in the United States that have an addiction, which is, um, it's very sad that we're losing a lot, of, a lot of our kids to that. So this one is kind of a hard one to listen to. Um, we lose 63,000 are lost to drug addiction a year. So you think about a town of 63,000 people are gone, and that's, that's our future. So that one was a hard one. Um, from the ages of 25 to 34, it's gone from 4% to 20% that are dying from an overdose. 42,000 deaths from opioid overdose. So one of the, some of the things they suggested is doing more research we need to know how to treat better. We have to expand prevention and education to keep from people from trying to, drugs. And one of the things they said, which I personally said I wouldn't put my opinion in here, so I won't. 
but what they said is try to keep people from trying drugs till their brain is fully developed. That is women at 21 and men at 25. I would say try to not have them in my opinion, try it at all, but. Um, and then they said that public health agencies should provide naloxone, which is something that I know that we're doing, and clean syringes, work on child welfare, recovery support, um, as addiction is a disease. Um, and then we need to do something with law enforcement and criminal justice to reduce drugs coming into our country. And of course, we all know expanding alternatives to incarceration. As we know, many of the people who are incarcerated, they just have some kind of mental problem or an addiction problem. They're really not bad people. They're not really criminals. Um, the federal bills that are out there right now are CARA and CURES. And then there's something called the Blue Prince Project, but I won't go into those. The other one was strengthening, the session I went to was strengthening the educational pipeline for college completion. Um, and it's about a promise program, and I'm sure many of you already know about it, and I think that's a lot. What we kind of do with our lottery is just making sure that first, you know, I think they have their first year that they have paid for. Uh, and most of the kids at Cerritos College, the president was speaking, uh, Jose Fierro, are 70% um, Latino that take part in this program, which is wonderful. Um, some of the things he said that leaders need to do is brand yourself successfully. Have conviction, know your facts, don't assume, have integrity, find your strengths, define who needs you, have courage, find forums where you can shine, study and exchange ideas, and manage your finances. Have a clear strategy. And one of the things he said that we all need to be careful with when it comes to social media is understand what you should post, respond to people in a reasonable amount of time, and don't throw grenades um, using action-based posting. So, and your press releases should reflect you, your voice, and properly disclose. And then one of the um, last ones I'll talk about was the Census 2020. John uh, Jarman, the acting census director, gave um, um, a talk about the cens Census 2020. Um, he wanted to make sure that everybody knew that Title 13 keeps the survey result results safe. Um, and this is talking to a lot of our um, population that are, they are saying that they are fearful. So he wanted to make sure that they know that it's illegal to share a person's census responses with law, enforce, law enforcement or ICE. Violating this law, this is something I didn't know, violating this law by sharing this information is a federal crime with a present sentence for the person who does it of up to five years and a fine of up to $250,000 or both. So this is also public information. It is not government information. Um, and it's been protected all the way up to the high courts. And also data is immune to legal proceedings. Um, Census Bureau confidentiality is very high as Title 13 requires that those who have access to this information are, sw are sworn to protect this information for life. So they're sworn for life. Um, he said census is a tool to empower and not marginalize. Um, every survey has people who skip questions and the citizenship question is the last one on the survey. Um, and he also said there's not support for the claim that this one question would re reduce response rates. The American Community Survey data showed that those who didn't answer that particular question was 11.6 to 12.3% of the Hispanic respondents, but there were similar non-response rates for other questions as well, so it wasn't just this question. Uh, the question was placed last to minimize the impact on census response rates. Um, we talked about how much time they would have to remove citizenship question. They were hoping the decision would be made by fall. Otherwise, they might have to reprint the surveys and that would add to the cost. Um, the cost for the 2020 survey though would be different um, as in the past because much of it will be completed online this time and not on paper. Um, across the world, those survey res results have been falling. Um, so knowing if we know this, it's important to allocate funds to market the census since we know that people aren't responding to surveys as much as they used to and that we need to make sure to reach out to hard to count populations. Um, California added state money of 90 million in census outreach. 
Um, and we have um, the census forward funded already a billion dollars. Um, 500 million has been allocated and I think used already to conduct 42 focus groups and survey 50,000 households to examine the attitudes they have about privacy and confidentiality and find out about census barrier motivators and get a communication plan. And that's gonna all be gathered and hopefully by this fall, they will come up with, um, I guess, a theme for the census. And um, they're gonna also spend 200,000 on partnership plans. And one of the things that they said, if we're concerned about our hard to count population to form a complete count committee, which is what a lot of states are doing. Um, and just form partnerships, faith-based organizations, local, county, state level, you know, League of Cities, any external parties. Um, and if people don't participate, then they win. So it's in everyone's best interest to complete the census. And the quote that I got that I remember from those three or four days that I was there was from a child who was just asking um, people if I could ask for anything, it would just be for you adults to listen and be kind. Thank you, Peggy, appreciate it. You're welcome. That. A lot of information. Uh, any comments from the board members? Uh, questions for board member Malera Gunn? I, I have a question too. Sure, board member Patterson. Yes, okay. Um, board member Aragon, you indicated there's a survey going out that has gone out to um, folks. Um, do you know how, how, what was the criteria for selecting those individuals? As far as what I remember, remember Mr. Jarman saying is that, that it was random. It was random. It was random, that's, that's what I understood, that it was going to be a random survey. It's a random survey. So in addition to the census form, there's a survey that's being sent out to see. I think they've done that, Member Patterson, that American Community Survey. So that's, I think, done every time that they do a census, from what I understand. On top of that, though, the focus groups that they're going to have, that's something that's different. It's, it's a different, and, and right. so I want to share with you that um, I, did, I did receive the survey and in reading the survey, if I don't complete that survey, I could be prosecuted for not completing the survey. Um, I don't know if anybody else has received the survey. I was one of those people that was um, actually selected, my household mm -hmm. was selected. So if we don't complete the survey, uh, we would be in severe trouble, both my husband and I. So that American Community Survey. What what Mr. Jarman said is there, and this is what he was talking about. He was talking mostly about the census, not about that survey. Okay. So all I can say is if somebody skips a question, and I know because the last time when I we my family was doing the survey, there was a question that we skipped, and so what they did is they came out to out to our home several times until we decided that we just finally had to answer the question. And this took like six or seven months and they just came out every month until we decided to answer the question. But I, I can't tell you if you don't answer the American, you know, the, that survey that you would be prosecuted. I didn't hear that at, I did not hear that at all. Yeah, there's a letter so. attached to it. Did you get selected? No, it sounds like harassment. No. Yeah, it, there was a letter in there. Yeah, I would find that too, yeah. you know. Anyway, thank you so much for You're your You're welcome. Board. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Yes, yeah. Board member Amiel. Yeah, thank you again for the, for the report on the conference. I had a quick question. You mentioned incentives around completion. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? They were just talked, that was just at the um, community college. What they were saying is that they don't um, incentivize, they don't incentivize completion of your degree. So there's no, in, there's, there's no incentives there, which I think is, you have, we're not looking at that, the output, we're kind of looking at the input, we're inputting students, but we're not looking at the output, so there's no incentives for them to, to come out. So it's a matter of trying to create that, and that's really was talking about higher ed. Thank you. You're welcome. Other comments? Board members? Board member Peterson? Yes. <clears throat> 
Yes, I think we need to do everything possible to spread the word that we need people to fill out the census, but I think we need to continue our efforts to have the citizenship question removed. I don't think there's sufficient information to prove that it's not going to depress response. And I think there's enough that there's enough fear in the community that we don't need to add to it. But with that said, I think it is really critical since you know part of our part of the information that's gone out to the immigrant community is for instance, you don't have to open the door if someone doesn't have a warrant, that there are things that families are doing that they feel like they need to do to be safe and protect themselves, but that the importance of the census is different in that we do need help, but it is a federal responsibility. And looking at the budget that we have in the state, I think we need to keep doing everything we possibly can for the feds to step up and to shoulder their part of the responsibility while we work on both the political and the informational end on our end. So thanks for the information. Right, and then so everybody knows there is this, um, if you go to the website, there is something called ROAM, R-O-A-M, and that is something that I think that New Mexico needs to make sure to use because it does give all the hard to count areas on a map for cities in and it tells you what areas are going to be hard to count so that would be important to make sure to get that information in my this is just my opinion um out there to make sure we know what areas are going to be hard to count in our city and our state so that is available for anybody it's for every state yep so, so, so you just go to the, the Census Bureau website, and um, it's R-O-A-M, and this just gives hard to count areas on a map so cities, counties, and states know where to send their message. So there will be places you need to send the message out for pla you know, places that might be harder for us to count. Like we might talk about, you know, like the Navajo Reservation that might be more difficult because they don't have access to, you know, certain things that we may have in our city. Just, just so people in our community know too, we did, it was not a unanimous vote, but we did as a board pass, uh, we passed a motion signing on to the Council of Great City Schools um, letter in opposition to having this as citizenship question on the census. So I, I think it is important. I think it was to Nalea. It was to Nalea. I think it was to Nalea. 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 That's right, it was Nalea. It was Nalea. What we did is the citizenship question. Right. That was to Nalea. It, it was a strong opposition, and it's supporting, in solid, we're in solidarity with Nalea in support of their um, opposition to the citizenship <laughs> question on the census 2020. And the board voted unanimously other than just one board member, pretty much. Okay, great. Other comments at all? Um, well, thank you, thank you, Peg. I appreciate it very much, and I appreciate uh, your participation with the Naleo folks. I think that is an important interface for us, and uh, so it's good to get information back, and it's good to to have a representation there. I think that's good for APS. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Of course. Uh, we'll go on to the last item here, which is a briefing on the 2018 New Mexico School Board Association's leadership retreat and board, the Board of Education's director meeting. And that's three of us, uh, myself, uh, Peggy, and Barbara. And I'm gonna start off with Barbara and the Board of Directors, because that always happens mm -hmm. before uh, our regular meeting. So tell us anything that you think is important about that Board of Directors meeting, Barbara. Let's see, just, just a couple of things. Um, financially, the association is in good shape. Uh, has some very responsible managing of money, so good things happen. One of the priorities has been the scholarship program, and so that's that's all good. Uh, one of one of the big things that was decided was to go ahead and purchase. Right now, the New Mexico School Board Association has its offices upstairs in a building that doesn't include within the offices a restroom. restroom. Yeah. 
there is no handicap accessibility, which makes it really difficult. But it's a great location in terms of the work that needs to be done with the public ed department, with the legislature. Um, and so some office spaces came available downstairs that has an indoor restroom and, <laughs> and that is handicap accessible and it has space for actually conducting meetings and business. And so the decision was made to go ahead and make that purchase. And it's gonna be cost effective because either the upstairs can be held onto and rented out um, or can be sold in its, its prime location. So it seemed like it would be a good, a good purchase. The fall regional meetings are going to be, for ours, it's Wednesday, October 10th in Mountaineer. And so that's, and the way that the regional meetings happen, the first meeting, the topic is decided upon by the board, by the executive board. It's sort of based on what requests come in and the spring meeting the topic is decided by the by the region itself. <coughs> uh, so that's coming up. We had changes to the bylaws and the policy that mainly was just bringing it into alignment with like the names of current conferences and meetings that people need to go to. The big the big topic that'll be on the agenda for the December conference is a constitutional change that would prohibit nominations from the floor. And of the board, of the board and of the group that, that met to look at the policy changes, we were unanimous in saying that was the case. Because it's a statewide organization without knowing ahead who's being nominated, there's really no opportunity to learn anything at all about them. Mm -hmm. And so the procedures of just saying if you're serious, because it's a huge time commitment to take on those executive positions, that we need to have time to know who people are, to listen to their story, to get to know them, and to make informed decisions. And so, that, so, for next so that would be a change that would be voted on in the December meeting. So that was really, those were the biggies. We always run out of time, so the educational portion, there's always supposed to be an educational component at the board meetings and we never get to it because the business <coughs> always takes place. Um, one of the other things, just in terms of tone, I, th I think one of the things that came up that it seems like there is virtual unanimity about was concern about the PED going around the governance structures of the districts, of conducting business directly, either, either pulling people out from a board or of going around and approaching teachers separately without looking at the governance structure within the within the districts and there was really concern about the disregard for the elected bodies so that was just discussed but no action no action was taken um, the the associate the conference itself is to me the most valuable part is just having a chance to sit down and talk to people you know, it's, it's always really interesting, it, both the similarities, whether it's someone from a really rural community that has a whole other set of concerns and issues. You know, like listening, thinking about implementing the next-gen science standards. It, a large district has one kind of uh, obstacle just because of the size of the district. And yet, if you're in Floyd, what, it, it, the resources that you have for implementation are real different. And so just listening and thinking about the, how diverse the, the state is, is always fascinating to me. Um, there's 
And one other bit of, of information. The last two conferences have had some um, opportunity for Indian Ed to really be addressed. And I think there are some really serious concerns uh, for tribal governance, the, the overlap of federal law, of state law, of funding, of local control, all of those issues just really get augmented and amplified, I think, for, for tribes that are trying to really look at everything from dual language programs to just funding issues. And so I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation of how do we use the school board association to really facilitate um, meeting the needs and having the conversation that's needed in that area. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. Board Member Muller, I got uh, your thoughts on the leadership. Um, well, I mean, something that I learned is for the session on guns on campus, some of the things that I did not know is that the people that could carry guns onto a campus that I didn't know. So besides peace officers, obviously, and the SROs um, and people involved in ROTC, but um, people that are in a class involved in carrying a deadly weapon or people that are older than 19 on, and they're on school premises in a vehicle for protection of their self or others, I didn't know that that was allowed. So did you? I, I didn't know that, that you could carry it on t in your vehicle onto campus, but they said you could. So that's an interesting one because I thought the gun-free zone would keep that from happening. So that had me a little bit confused because I thought you wouldn't be able to do that if you had gun-free zones that you still wouldn't be able to carry it onto the parking lot if that was a gun-free zone. So it'd be interesting to find out if that I'm, I don't know if anybody else was in that. People that aren't students, are you talking about? Uh-huh, it says anybody older than 19 that's on school premises in a vehicle it's or. Typically not a student, but. Typically not for lawful protection of their self or others. So it's basically saying anybody who's not a student, if they're protecting themselves or others, that they can. So I just thought that would be a conflict with, so with gun-free zone. Yeah, there's a question of what it is we mean by protecting themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I, I that's I wrote down exactly what exactly yeah, what someone that's said. Probably interpretation kind of thing. Now, I don't think it means you just carry it on just just because you happen to be wandering on campus. I mean, maybe if it, you're protecting yourself because somebody's chasing you or there's a gunfight going on or some item. Maybe I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting to get more clarification yeah, on that. I, I think that's, that's important to 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 know whoever can yeah. find out the answer to that. <laughs> that would be a good. Figure out what that means. I'm, I, I'm a little nervous. Dr. Bowman is looking. <laughs> Are you looking? And then there was some, some really, I just wanted to give a shout out to some uh, um, APS schools when it came to growth and student achievement in math. Seven of the 10 top schools were APS schools. Yep. So I don't remember them all. I know like Desert Willow, North Star, <laughs> Hubert Humphrey Ames. I, I can't remember. Double Eagle, S.Y. Jackson. I don't, I don't remember what the seven were, but I just wanted to give a shout out to them because they, they deserve it. So I thought that was awesome. And then also student achievement in um, language arts, early college academy was 87%, um, CCHS was 84.4, um, Desert Willow 76.3%. So I think that that is a story that we often don't tell that we need to make sure that we do tell that there are really some good things going on out there that we need to corral us. I have to say corral us because that's in, in my district, <laughs> um, that there's been tremendous growth there and also Montessori of the Rio Grande. So I'm going to give a shout out to them. And it was um, the other thing that I thought was really fun, we went to the color communication session. I think that Barbara was was in there. And it was, I, I just always think it's fun to see what kind of a person you are and what the world's population is. So if you can see yourself in this, 45% of the world population is gold color. 
which means you're structure-oriented, organized, you like order and rules, respect and dependability are important. You need to be on time, you need to follow a plan or schedule. Um, I was not gold. <laughs> you were going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know I'm not gold? 30% um, of the thirty percent of the population is orange. They tend to be creative and active, become bored and restless with routine and structure. They desire independence and freedom. That's me. 15% uh, of the world population is blue. They tend to be communicative, compassionate, empathetic. They're cooperative and like harmony. And then the other 10% is green. They crave information. Data drives their soul, and there's never enough data. They seek a challenge, and they enjoy exploring ideas. So, and this I want to leave you with. Went to the politics, ethics, and social media session. Did you go to that one? Did you go to that one, Dave? Um, so whenever you're using social media, be careful. They said no right is without its limitations. Conduct yourself in a manner that reflects well in the district. And remember, everything you post, remember the rule is treat every post as if it will appear on the front page, not of a local newspaper, but of a national newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. That's um, yeah. I, uh, well, thank you very much for you two. Uh, I, just a couple of impressions. You know, I, I've been going to these meetings a long time. It's kind of like being an adult for a long time. And, long. and I kind of heard a lot of the same things, <laughs> to tell you the truth, you know, in the meetings. Um, and I, I don't think that's bad necessarily, because I think there are a lot of new people that come and, you know, we need to hear a lot of things. There were a lot of new board members. Yeah, and so I think that's okay for me, though. I, because I, I looked, you know, I looked at like good leaders managing the relationships and school board presidents. What are we supposed to do? Well, you know, I'm not sure I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, but you know, um, and the politics, ethics. You know, I, I've I've heard this a lot. You know, please don't post something if you don't want it to be, you know, your mom to see it. Um, uh, but I did think that the, you know, the presentations that were just kind of by the school board association itself were nice. I thought, you know, uh, Ortiz did a nice job on that. Um, and then we, we did have, of course, our two gubernatorial candidates who gave us well, a little bit of a spiel on, on the education. And uh, I think, generally speaking, for both of them, uh, I heard a lot of similar things, maybe from a different perspective in each one, but you know, a lot of them really said, uh, both of them, I should say a lot of them, both of them, uh, really said uh, local control was really pretty important. In other words, you know, it's important for us to have, have a voice. Uh, I don't think either one of them are interested in, in totally revamping everything, because I'm not sure that's possible, but, but I think that, that they were interested in some changes that would would maybe help us here in APS in particular. Uh, I think uh, they had a little bit of different perspective on some things, but uh, pretty much were very much, I think, oriented to trying to help education and not necessarily just fix it, mm -hmm. you know. I don't think they're interested in just fixing something. I think they're interested in how do we really work together and how do we collaborate. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, to that. I think it's part of it, no matter who's, who's the who's the real uh, uh, one who wins the election. Uh, so it was good to hear from both of them. And I think that's important for us to, as a, uh, the NMSBA, is to really have a voice in how that education process is going to work. And so uh, I think from our perspective, and working with the legislature, working with the NMSBA, and working with our, uh, with our, our, our executive group, you know, uh, we need to, know how to do that, and I think we're going to have an interesting transition here to see how we can work with them. And, uh, so uh, I think we need to be proactive in terms of what we're doing and, and what you know, the state really wants us to do and how we can work uh, locally here to, to better our education. So, um, so I thought that was good. And of course, I love Taos. I mean, Taos is a wonderful place, you know, if you have to drive someplace that's not a bad place to drive to. And, uh, and I think just talking with all the different people, I think 
that was uh, what Barbara said was, was really important, to be able to hear from other board members. And I would like to say that relative to the uh, issue of not taking nominations from the floor, I would, I would like to take some personal uh, uh, emphasis on what I think is the right thing, and that is the right thing. Uh, I got so tired of people nominating people from the floor, and I had no idea who they were. I had no information about them at all. And there's a little group here that, that wanted somebody. I said, well, we have a nominating committee here on the board. They look at all nominations. You have to f fill out a little form, and you have to put in a little resume, and you have to say what you're about. And so the people get a chance to read that. They get a chance to hear about that. And that's, be, that's why we have a nominating committee. Uh, the only time I would allow a nomination from the floor is if there weren't anybody that wanted to run. And that's a possibility. But I think, again, that's a very good move. And I remember I told you I would never run again if I if, if they wouldn't allow they allow <laughs> nominations from the floor because I'm tired of tired of hearing from people that I don't really have an idea who they are, you know. And uh, I think that's a very good move. So, you know, it's part of being kind of responsible to if if you don't know you want to run until the moment you're being nominated, that's a little late, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think you ought to plan it out. You ought to decide you because it's a commitment. Let me tell you something. It's a commitment. If you're going to commit to being a vice president, that means you're going to have one year's vice president, one year's president-elect, one year's president, and one year after that. That's four-year commitment. You better know. You better decide that you you want to be there and you want to help do this, if that's what you're going to be your commitment. So, good job. And the commitment has to include running for your own seat again. That's because right. Because chances are being in that position is going to overlap with your own election cycle. That's exactly cycle. right. That's exactly right. So it, it's a, it's a long-term commitment. And it's, not, it's not something you want to just blindly go in and say, oh, yeah, I think we need to do this. So very much appreciate it. And, and just for those here, that the Board of Directors is really from all the different districts. And then we have a couple of at-large uh, members, and Barbara's one of the at-large members uh, from uh, this large district here. Uh, so, and they're the ones who meet with the staff at the, the NMSBA, and they go over all the bylaws and the various other things that need to be done. And I'll guarantee you that staff at the NMSBA is efficient, uh, very, very good. They're one of the best in this country. Mm -hmm. And for the cost that we have, it's, they do a immense number of things. So, uh, it's just a great organization. Joe Gian is is a number one. So yeah. thank you very much, and thanks for, for being at the leadership. Okay, so we'll go on to our um, our board member comments. Uh, any board member comments? And I'll start down here. Board member Mijo. Um So actually, I wish I could give up my board comments to hear more from the community, um, specifically our community members and our neighbors about their concerns and recommendations for our immigrant and refugee brothers and sisters, um, specifically the newcomer program. I mean, we have students, we have parents, we have advocates, and we have teachers in the room. And I'd like to know whether or not um, their input was considered or if they were invited to the table when the discussions uh, took place and when changes were made to the newcomer program. I'd also like to mention to, to Manny, Manny, that I'm still trying to master English, and you know four languages, so I just, uh, I, I appreciate, um, and I, I enjoyed watching you when you presented about transportation too last year too, and th that has always stuck with me, and I have, um, and I have had that discussion with other people since then. Um, so the issue around transportation. And you know, um, and, and hearing from folks like Natalie Sang, who, um, who was a speaker at our Civil Rights and Diversity Conference last year as well. I mean, we, we, I don't know if the board realizes the incredible amount of people that are in this room. Everything from Rachel White to, to Travis to, sorry, both Tonys. <laughs> and uh, I mean, there is an incredible group of people um, in this room, and I'm sorry I didn't name all of you that are in here, but, um, uh, you know, Selena, I mean, an incredible group in this, 
of people in this room today, and I really appreciate that. And it um, speaks volumes to have you be in the same room and share your concerns about about this program. And um, and I, I really want to know more about, you know, what what are the recommended changes that um, uh, you know Rachel brought up as well. So. I'd like to see more about the newcomer program and about the suggested changes that are being made and, and how we're involving this incredible group of advisors that you have sitting in this room. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Board Member Armijo. Uh, Board, Board Member Patterson. Buenas tardes. Y muchas gracias por estar aquí en apoyo de sus familias. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for being here, and I appreciate um, this is probably the second or third time I've heard from you, from the community, our advocates who are here. I heard from them on Monday, and um, uh, very telling stories. But what I wanted to say is that, you know, AP, APS does a lot of things for, for our families, for our children and families. You know, we keep our children safe from, uh, you know, from ICE. We've managed to keep ICE away from our schools. We have safe zones for our children, for our LGBT, for our dreamers. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel safe, you know where to go in school. There are safe places in the schools. Mm -hmm. And the board also voted. You know, you know, this is our voice also, not to include the citizenship question on, on the census 2020. So there's a list of things that APS does. And so, but one of the things I wanted to say is that I, I believe that our community needs to be involved. The voices need to be at the table. Everybody needs to be at the table. When APS makes decisions, we always involve the community. And some of those folks are here today. And I appreciate that they're here. They've taken the time. They've spent an awful lot of time uh, working out in the community. And we need to honor their voice. I think it is incumbent upon APS to honor all the voices in the community that we hear from all the stakeholders when we make these decisions. Because together, we can't do this alone. It takes all of us. And together, I think we can come up with solutions that work for, for everybody. And so I, I would hope that we involve this community that's here and all of the other stakeholders that are not here today. And I would hope that we all can work together. I'm, I'm here to also support our community as well. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Board Member Parish. Board Member uh, Cordova. Um, so first of all, I just wanna say thank you to everyone that came out for the public forum tonight because I want you to know that I do stand in solidarity for the issues and the concerns that you have. But tonight I need to read a statement um, that I, I have to make because this is I would be remiss if I didn't because I need to support my community. Um, so I'm going to trust the, my esteemed colleagues on the board to continue to state uh, some things for you. So uh, the Albuquerque Journal included an editorial Sunday, July 29th, about the recent rulings by Judge Singleton, noting the state is violating the constitutional rights of at-risk students by failing to provide them with a sufficient education and her order to lawmakers and the governor to pump more money into the system. The author stated, quote unquote, that the vast majority of the state's children can't read or do math at grade level and our proficiency ratings are downright appalling and unacceptable, close quote. The editorial further noted, quote unquote, the harsh reality that it takes uh, a lot more than just increased funding to bring about success in the classroom and used Rio Grande High School as an example of how extra funds alone do not do the work, noting a failure to improve scores at Rio Grande High School. Needless to say, I found the editorial concerning due to its negative portrayal of Rio Grande High School, calling it a quote unquote, chronically underperforming school, and that although given a quote unquote, dizzying array of reforms, everything from early childhood programs for South Valley children, no improvements have been seen. What bothered me was the portrayal of the school, the community, and the label South Valley children. More attention was paid to calling out the community, the South Valley, with a sense of degradation, hopelessness, and misery, painting the community as one with many intractable problems. Albuquerque Journal, if you're listening, words matter, and your lack of attention to the bigger picture of social and economic disparity is mean-spirited. Improving student outcomes and addressing the gaps between majority poor disabled students and their white middle-class counterparts 
does take effort, but it also takes more than the quote unquote hard work and data driven reform you mentioned. It requires commitment to school, to social reforms that address affordable housing, access to quality and consistent health and behavioral health, removing food insecurity and creating access to quality and nutritious food, as well as economic reforms that lead to employment with sustainable and living wages. It also includes cultural humility that respects and celebrates families in various forms and fosters value for individuals. The journal has a responsibility to promote fair and balanced portrayal of the South Valley community. Media images and words do matter, and I caution for some of your readers who have never interacted with families from the South Valley or stepped foot into a school or program in the South Valley to not embrace what you call, what you tell them about South Valley children. The divide between communities in Albuquerque continues to grow, and it's no wonder the South Valley often feels the brunt of negative bias. The negative impact of media bias and hurtful, wor and hurtful words hits the members of the community hard. I know, I live in the South Valley. Derogatory portrayals are demoralizing and reduce self-esteem, and in worst case scenarios, youth internalize these biases and stereotypes, and through their behavior, reinforce and even perpetuate their misrepresentations. They become victims of misperception. I felt this in my youth, and no youth today certainly feel the same. The journal is aware of its vast power to shape popular ideas, opinions, and attitudes. You should become equally cognizant of your role as a mechanism of social change. The journal can and should choose words, images, and new angles that give a fuller, more nuanced narrative of children living in the South Valley, its culture, its people, and its way of life. Additionally, South Valley children are individuals, not a type of child. Your failure to address them as people first is appalling. Journal, if you're listening, where were your stories celebrating Rio Grande High School's accomplishments this past year? Did you know Rio Grande hosted a statewide summit for Jobs for America's grads? Students from across the state and local business leaders and program leaders were there. I was there and was impressed by the quality of the program, the talent, and flexibility of the school staff to host well over 100 students while maintaining a regular school schedule. It was genius. And did you know about the number of JAG students who participated in Job Shadow Day and successfully landed paid summer work experience? I see and interact with these students from the South Valley daily and their maturity and professionalism while on the job is astounding. Or what about the percentage of AP students completing AP exams at Rio Grande? It was over 76% this year. What do you know about these students from the South Valley? Why doesn't the journal cover their story? Mm -hmm. And what about an editorial about the bilingual SEAL program at Rio Grande? Rio Grande had 29 students completing the program, and six of those students received a seal of distinction. I attended the end of the year ceremony and the student stories of personal triumph resilience and pride of being able to preserve culture and language were more than newsworthy. They were inspiring. Parents were beaming and I thought, wow, what a legacy for the school district and the community. Or the story about the increase in park scores for English language learners for 2017, 2018. Why wasn't, that, why wasn't this covered? What did these students from the South Valley overcome to succeed? When I sought the appointment to the board, one of my areas of interest was continued negative perception of the South Valley and the harm it has on the psyche of children and their families in the community. I vow to confront these perceptions, noting that personal impact, noting the personal impact these negative perceptions and bias I experienced as a student and a member of the South Valley when I was a student at Rio Grande High School. Children from the South Valley are not flawed, nor are they a failed project or policy. Journal, if you are listening, stop, re stop referencing South Valley children as a specific type of child. It's irresponsible and damaging. Remember, they are children and students first, students from the South Valley. And finally, I challenge the journal to meet me at Rio Grande High School or any other school in the South Valley to do a quality story about amazing children, hardworking staff and parents, and a community dedicated to addressing challenges and big dreams for our children. Thank you. Thank you, board member. Board member Garcia. Awesome. Thank you, board member Montoya Cordova. Uh, as someone who grew up in the South Valley and uh, 
experienced some of the very things that you you uh, reminded us of. I, I knew I was enraged when I read that editorial, but I, I couldn't say why. Uh, for those of you who came this evening, I want to thank you for coming. Uh, for those of you who are here as community members, uh, I appreciate your courage and your tenacity and your determination for us to get it right for your students, uh, for your children, for your family members and neighbors. Um, Mr. Ramirez, thank you for what you're doing with men of color. Uh, Mr. Padilla, thank you for being a teacher and sticking by us. Uh, so many have decided to to leave APS and go to a charter school where the grass may look greener, but I don't necessarily know that that's, that's accurate. I certainly don't think it is. Um, you know, I, I want to say that uh, what you're challenging us to do is to how to, how to have the harder, harder conversation. I think APS, in, in all fairness, uh, is trying to do the right thing by refugee families, students. Uh, the plan that was implemented uh, certainly doesn't meet the needs of high school students, as you've outlined. We knew that. Uh, I knew that watching uh, previous testimony from some of you and from some students who frankly broke my heart when they said they wanted to be a doctor, but they were still trying to learn English. Mm -hmm. um, these are the hard conversations that we don't know how to have. Um, as staff members, my expectation would be those of you who are in positions of having relationships with the community to not just help the community throw stones, but actually help us have that harder conversation. We need you to help us to facilitate the conversation between our community uh, programs department, I don't remember what it's called, uh, Dr. Muir's department. We need to have you help us, help your leaders in your departments where you work to sit down and think how we can go about bringing a meeting of the minds together. Um, sometimes the best plans are not exactly what is going to meet the need, and we have an emerging need. We have a, a world of, you know, several million refugees who are uh, roaming because of war and economies that are uh, hostage to a failing economic and social order. Um, how do we implement a thoughtful plan that's going to meet as best we can the needs of the students who are here? That's a challenge for us all. And I think I have to say in my understanding and experience, uh, I think APS is well intended. We may be sometimes uh, not real good at communicating why a decision was made, in this case to focus on elementary students. I don't know. Uh, but certainly the need continues, as you've pointed out, for other students. So how do we move forward? And my hope is that we can move forward by trying to put down some of the uh, strong emotions that we feel, whether we feel defensive about the fact that uh, you're not seeing what we're trying and how good the effort has been, or whether we feel angry over the fact that, you know, this young person can't read. Uh, I think we have to do better. Um, I just don't know exactly how we get there, and I would challenge the superintendent and chief of staff to see if with your leadership team can put your heads together and help us come up with a, a constructive opportunity uh, that will have to be created by all parties. We need to work together. We need to move forward. Um, I can't imagine some of the stories that each of you have as refugee students. Um, I certainly can celebrate you, in my mind at least, for knowing five languages for being able to come here and say what you think. There's still big challenges for us as a district because we have so many students who are undocumented, who aren't official immigrants, but who live like many do nowadays in fear, uh, in fear because of uh, an unfair economic and social order. 
and the racism that's being pr promoted in the highest office of the land. Uh, it's outright racism and it's wrong. And we have to stand together. We cannot afford to turn against each other. But we have to stand together and try to come up with a way to move forward and problem solve. So that's my comment for this evening. And again, I want to go back to you, Ms. Montoya Cordova. Thank you for your leadership and your courage and uh, mm -hmm. for the class and the way that you approach things and say things. Uh, Lucky for us, we have you as a member on this board. Mm -hmm. I would hope that you would submit what you read this evening to the journal to see if they'd be willing to publish it. I'm planning to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very concerned that what we have is a situation where the journal is our paper of record, newspaper of record, and yet our, our voices are not being heard there. There's just a particular line that gets put out there over and over again, and some variation here and there, but for the most part, uh, it's a political line, and I think that's a violation of all of our freedom of speech, um, and I would hope that some lawyers someplace will figure out how to challenge them for what they're not doing and for what they are doing by distorting the conversation and continuing uh, the horrible things that uh, seem to pass for normal these days. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Garcia. Board Member Peterson. Um, I'll just simply, well, I'll start by simply uniting with, with the comments that other people have made. I mean, my two schools of Hawthorne and Whittier have been cast in the same light exactly as Los Padillas and Rio Grande. High school, Highland High School works hard to meet the needs of an incredibly diverse group of students. And Hawthorne, to be plastered by the Secretary of Ed as having failed generations of students, um, it goes on and on. And I, I, over this last week, because I've been part of conversations and trying to listen and parse through where do we go from here, what does it look like, how did we get where we are. Sometimes I think it's partly with the district not trying to do wrong, but by trying to look at what's doable and taking on what's doable and seeing it from that point of view and feeling like going with the La Mesa K-6 program, it's I think what, what was felt is doable. And I think that's probably one reason why it was formed the way it was, trying to put it together. And clearly, it's, it doesn't meet all of the needs that need to be met. Um, we can talk about how nothing matters except what's internal to a student. But we know that what a student can do depends on what resources we make available to them. And I think one of the things that we have to look really seriously at is how are we allocating resources within the district? Because it's, it's fine to say all kids can learn, but we know that without the right setting and without the right supports, that kids aren't going to be as successful as they could be and should be. And so I think we need to really, really start looking carefully if we're going to talk equity. And I think we mean it when we talk about equity, but it really means looking at resources in a different way and how we allocate them. Because I think that's one of the barriers. I, I mean, I've talked to the principals at Van Buren and Thailand, and they are absolutely committed and wanting to do right by the students that are there. But it partly comes down to, are, are there teachers to fill those roles? Are finding finding people, we know that there are people in the community who have the linguistic skills to support students, whether they have the credentials that are needed to fit in a certain role might be something different. And so then how do we figure out how to have people with the language skills to put together with people who have the content and academic skills of what's needed? I mean, it takes, it's not as simple solution 
but we've got to figure out how to do it. And, I, and there are definitely some pathways that, that I think have been grappled with. So how do we expand? I don't think that, personally, I, th I think there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of excitement for implementing what exists at La Mesa. There are some things like transportation that still needs to be worked out. Partly it's because without knowing who, what students are there, figuring out magically what transportation is needed, you know, we've got to see who's there and then figure out how to get kids there and how to support that. What, what we need to make available at Highland and at um, Van Buren in particular, it comes down to we need human beings. And with, for human beings, we need, we need some, the ability to staff those positions. And I think the district needs to really look seriously at how we do that. Um, I think we can do it. I, I, don't think, I don't think we have to be hostile. I think there's been miscommunication and non-communication and, and horizontal communication going past people. And we need to step back, open up the door for sitting down and, and sorting this through. We have some resources with the community schools coordinators who are there. We have some family liaisons. It's, it's not too late to look seriously at this year. And I think that we can build, continue building towards where we're going in the future. And some of it probably is figuring out seriously what's going to be successful for students. Because what one student needs and what their vision for their future is may be different for another student. So for some students, getting that diploma, being able to get into the workforce and figuring out how we, how we get some specific skills for one student may be really different from a student that's saying, you know, college, a doctor. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a professional, have a professional career. And what that student needs may be different. And so we've got to, we've got to open up those pathways, um, work to collaboratively with UNM, with CNM with what we already have in place with things like um, CEC and college and career and early college academy. How can, we, how can we bolster resources that we have, but most immediately look at what do we have at Highland and Van Buren in particular that we need to support for this year. So it's not, it's not, there's not a magic wand. It's not magical. We've just got to grapple with it with each other and figure out how to make it happen. Thank you. Board Member Merle Aragon. Um, first of all, I just had forgotten to do this at the last couple of board meetings, and I I'm so sorry that I have. I went to the graduation ceremony at the, um, in the jail um, back in June. Um, these are a lot of people that are totally forgotten and invisible to a lot of us, and I don't want to ever forget them. Um, so their names are never called out for a lot of people to hear. Um, they're not videotaped, so um, somebody can see them. And so I just want to make sure to call out all their names. Some of these um, young men and women are absolutely brilliant. And if you would take the time to know them, you would be very proud. Um, these are the names of the June graduates. Um, they did what they had to do behind bars in very difficult, very difficult situations that many of us would never, ever make it through. Their names are Daisy McLean, Andrea Thomason, John Brumet, Lee Brandenburg, Mark Mora, Ashante Periotti, Jacob Ramirez, Ruben Ramirez, Craig Smith, David Spitz, and Nicholas Tanner. And I'm very proud of them. So I hope you all, if you could give them a big hand because their families can hear this forever. <laughs> And 
And I think this is something that, that we can do better, is our kids, all the refugees and immigrant population deserve better than a minute. And I think that's something that we ourselves can decide to give longer than that if we're willing to sit here for two hours to listen to what's important for our kids. I think that they deserved it. And my apologies that we didn't put that out there because I think that we could do that. So I, I apologize to all of you. You deserve, you even deserve more than two minutes. So if we have to be here sometimes for several hours to hear about those concerns, I personally am willing to sit here for that long. So I'm sorry. Um, what I heard tonight is that when we're talking about people, children learning another language, we have, I've been told anyway that it takes several years for that to happen. So if we're talking about high school students, they don't have several years. Some of those kids are coming, they're, they're already juniors or seniors. They don't have seven years with us. They have that year. What are we doing for them for that year? We're saying we're gonna start with the elementary kids. And I'm a big fan of elementary children. I was an elementary teacher. But we're looking at these kids having to go out and then they're saying they can't go to college because they don't know how to speak the language, they don't know how to read. What are we doing to them? Do we really wanna destroy them? I'm sure we don't. But are we doing the right thing by this program? Um, I know uh, Rachel White, you're absolutely amazing. I, I'm very proud of everything you did. I want to listen to people that understand. I want to listen to all of you out there who understand that community. We should be listening to you. We should be listening to the students. They know what works better for them. Is that what we did with this newcomer program? Is it? I mean, you all know, you, you, you know, did we listen to you? Were you at the table? Should you be? They're your kids. It's, it's your community. It's our community. It's our future. I want to listen to you, and I believe that APS wants to listen to you. So whatever we have to come up with, then we need to figure it out. So let's do that. And I'm asking the superintendent to please let's figure, let's figure out what's gonna be best because I don't think that anybody who is here tonight thinks that we did the right thing. And I think that you all feel that you were excluded and that's not what you should feel. I know at the meeting that we were at a few months ago and we heard from a lot of you, I, it seems like we didn't though, because I don't know if anything that you asked for was put into motion. It doesn't seem like, from what I remember, it seems like you were cut off, that we didn't maybe want to listen to you anymore. I hope that's not the case, but I think that's how a lot of you feel from looking at your faces. I want to hear you, and you're welcome to call me anytime, and keep on putting things out there, keep on talking to the superintendent, keep on talking to the administration till you get what's right for those kids because they deserve the very best. They are our tomorrow, and we can't just let them be out there and not be prepared. Thank you, board member. Uh, great set of board members. Uh, it always leaves me with not too much to say. <laughs> uh, just a couple things. Uh, relative to most of the public forum persons, uh, the one or two minutes is really not the place for a deep discussion. It's not going to happen. We've worked hard at trying to figure out different mechanisms and different ways to get a better discussion and more deep discussion and those kind of things. And it, it's not going to happen in this kind of a context. It's just it's not the right context. We need to have more of a give and take, not just you speaking and then 
us listening. We have to have more of a dialogue, and this, this is not the right forum to have a dialogue. So we need a better, a better mechanism to do that. And some of those mechanisms, I think, can be set up by the staff, can be set up by meetings with you guys, uh, uh, community meetings, things that we have. Those are better forums for actually understanding better about what the community is feeling. Um, I've, I actually looked at the, the plans. I've, I've gone to La Mesa. I've, uh, I, I, I don't know whether the issue is with the plan itself, the pilot we're trying, or whether it's just that it, you don't think it goes far enough in terms of other things. In other words, I've looked at the plan myself, and I, don't, I, I think there's a lot of good things that are going on there. I think there's a lot of good ideas that are part of that. Now, whether there's enough there, or whether we're not doing enough in the high school, or we're not doing whatever, I, I don't doubt that at all. So the, the problem is, is trying to figure out where to go from there. In other words, the idea is, what do we do with the high school if it's not doing good, well enough with what we're doing in Highland? For example, I, I greatly uh, uh, respect what Rachel White has done in Highland. I mean, I've talked with Rachel a lot. Uh, and I think there's great things there that have been done. So we're really working hard to work with some of the refugee programs. So that's got to be a positive. But the question is, okay, what should we really be doing to kind of advance that? How do we, how do we sustain what we're doing, but how do we scale it? How do we scale a little bit more? And if there are some good suggestions for doing that, and, and we have resources to do that, then those are the things we need to work on, okay? So I, I'm, I'm big about trying to do those things, but, but I don't want to... Uh, uh, make it negative about what we're trying to do if that if that part of it is okay in other words I don't know exactly but it looked like it was a pretty sound idea and it's a pilot but to try to put a lot of things together in La Mesa and we also have a, a teacher prep program a, a, a thing with UNM where we're getting some internships and other things there so there's a combination of things that are going on at La Mesa that we think will probably be very good. And it's a K-8 program. It's not just a K-6. It's a K-8 program. And also we have it in Van Buren. So the idea is to try to get a cohort. That's part of the zone idea, too, is to try to get a cohort going from elementary to middle school to high school. And how does that work? And can we make that flow? Um, so we've got to think more strategically in how we're going to try to do that. So what we need to do is we need to make sure we're positive about that. Let's get together and let's make sure we're doing it, not being negative about not doing something. But let's get together and let's see how we can do that. Uh, I think a lot of you had really, really good ideas. Maybe maybe we didn't have enough time to talk about it, obviously. That's, you know, it's not enough time. So uh, let's get our staff together and have some more discussions about this. I don't think that necessarily means what we're doing right there in La Mesa is a bad thing. I want to make sure we kind of understand the differences. Uh, if we're not doing enough in certain areas, then that's, that's part of it. But we really have to get the early education started with our kids so that they will, in fact, progress and they will, in fact, get to mid-school and high school and be okay. The high school kids, let's talk about that. We can't solve all of the high school problems, probably. There's got to be some other kind of a combination with uh, maybe the university, with CNM, with others, with the business world, because they don't have enough time when they're there. And let me, let me tell you, they're asked to do some things that are not right for those students. For example, if you're there for one, the first year you're here, you may come from an African country where you've had very little formal education. That's not Mahdi's. Mahdi's got four languages. That's not the case for a lot of our refugee students. A lot of them don't have a real formal language. So they come to us without maybe a lot of formal education. And yet the first year, they're required to take a writing and a math test in part. That's not right. We have a lot of EL students that are not refugee students that are required to take part tests before they exit out of the access program. That's not right. There are a lot of things here that are a, a basis for having problems that we need to resolve. And you need to help us do that, see? That's not our deal. That's not APS requiring this. This is required by the state. That's not right. That doesn't mean necessarily these students are not bright. Don't get me wrong here. I'm just saying, if you take me over there and make me take a writing test and a math test in Swahili in Africa, I'm not going to do real well. And I'm pretty dadgum good in math, okay? So I'm just telling you, 
there are some things here that are not right, and we're trying to do the best job we can with a lot of these things and with the resources we have. That doesn't mean we're doing everything right. But I think the programs I saw there, at La Mesa and Van Buren, are an attempt to try to see how do we really make this progression from the early childhood all the way through. And Highland is there on the basis of basically what Rachel White's done. You know, whatever's there is there. That may not be enough. So the question is, what do we do do that? The transportation issue that Barb mentioned, yes, absolutely we need to solve that, particularly if we're going to have a cohort that goes to La Mesa and, and Van Buren. We've got to make sure everybody has transportation. We've got to make sure everybody can get that. Okay? So if we can identify all that and make sure that happens, let's see how that works. Okay? Uh, but I think we, the point is we do want your voice. We want your voice, but, but let's be cooperative in that voice. Let's, let's make it happen. You, you know the people to contact here. You, you can contact uh, Raquel Reedy, and I guarantee you she will get you the right people. Uh, Madeline Cernan Marmol, she's going to get you the right people. Madeline knows an awful lot about this issue. Let me tell you something. She knows an awful lot about this issue. And she's working really, really hard to try to make sure that we're, we're working on this equity part with our, with our refugee students. We have policies, procedures we put together as a board that are very much in favor of our protection of our immigrant students. I think we've done a lot here, guys. So let's be working together. Let's not be working against each other. Because if we work against each other, now we're not going to be making any progress. Okay? So let's work together on this, okay? Uh, the only other thing I'd like to say is that I, uh, I greatly appreciate Board Member Montoya Cordova's comments. Uh, I, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, when we get compared in some way to Gadsden or Texaco or some other, uh, I, I just I can't even tell you how statistically insignificant that kind of comment is. That's incorrect. And I have mentioned this to the journal. I have mentioned this privately to them. And they still continue to make these headlines and these other things that are negative. We've got to get a different perspective. And I'm not calling on anybody. Okay? This is our time here. 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 This is not your time. This is our time. Okay? So I'm telling you right now, I appreciate, greatly appreciate what Board Member Cordova has said. And I hope you do send this to the journal because it's important. It's important for us to start standing up for who we are and what we're trying to do for our kids. And that's what our, that's what our people here who came to, to talk to us tonight, they're standing up for this. And we need to do the same thing. We're working on how we do that. And I think uh, we need to be polite in how we do that. We need to be respectful and professional in how we do that. But we need to provide the facts and the information that is correct. And we need to make sure that that gets out. So thank you very much. I appreciate all the board comments. And uh, with that, we will go on to announcement of the upcoming board meetings. The next ones will be Wednesday, August 15th at 5 p.m. And the next special board meeting will be August 27th at 7.30 near Leo Martin. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you. You have a date. Can I make up stories? <laughs> Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you. Don't know how Lorenzo is on. Oh, you want them? Yeah. Let's see. I